Okay, hi everyone and welcome to lecture 2-2. So in this lecture we're talking about the back, the uh, musculature of the back, the superficial back muscles, the deep back muscles, uh, how those differ, how they're innervated, uh, things such as that. So this first slide is showing you some of the palpable surfaces of the back. Uh, so this image actually comes from your Gilroy's Atlas of Anatomy textbook. So uh, hopefully you have that textbook by now. You can refer to that so you can uh, get these images in more detail. Um, but when you're doing physical examinations as a future physical therapist, as a kinesiologist, these are going to be the palpable landmarks from which you're going to um, uh, identify uh, the bony prominences and move from there to find the muscular attachments and be able to palpate those muscles and, and feel their movements in your patients. So these are important landmarks. Uh, when we get to dissection, it's important to be able to use these landmarks to start your dissection. So as we start our dissection, what we'll be doing is, first of course, we'll have to remove the skin. As we cut through the skin, there are multiple layers of the skin uh, that you'll want to be aware of and that will, uh, the knowledge of these layers will help your dissection process. They'll allow you to know if you've cut uh, deep enough, not deep enough, too deep, and it'll give you the advantage of finding um, the, the location where you need uh, in order to find the structures that are important in dissection. So, of course, the skin is composed of an epidermis, dermis, and superficial fascia. The epidermis is just the uh, most superficial layer of epidermal skin cells. These skin cells travel down around the hair follicles uh, as well as around the sebaceous glands. The dermis, on the other hand, is the layer of the skin that is vascularized. So the epidermis has no vascular uh, structures. There's no veins or arteries in the epidermis. All of the uh, energy and oxygen that gets to the epidermis has to get there through diffusion from the dermis. So the dermis is gonna be the location where all of the vasculature is located. <clears throat> As you go deep from the dermis, uh, will enter the uh, superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is the layer of the skin that contains the lipids, uh, the subcutaneous fat, as well as the larger unbranched cutaneous arteries, veins, and nerves. So there are two layers to the superficial fascia. I just described the fatty layer, but there is also, uh, so, uh, there's also a membranous layer just deep to the fatty layer. So we see the fatty layer here represented by the yellow uh, lipid-like tissue in this drawing. And just deep to that, I'm outlining in red, is the membranous layer. Deep to that membranous layer of superficial fascia is another layer of fascia called the deep investing fascia, shown here in blue. The deep investing fascia is another form of membranous fascia. And between the membranous layer of superficial fascia and the deep investing fascia is a potential plane. Uh, so this plane allows the smooth movement of muscles under the skin so that the skin isn't uh, adhering to the muscles and causing friction. Because this plane exists, we can also take advantage of it in dissection uh, to easily remove the skin. So as we dissect through the skin, we're going to uh, dissect through the uh, fatty layer, superficial fascia, to get to that membranous layer. Then we can uh, form that plane with blunt dissection and remove the skin more easily so we can see the more important structures, which are the muscles and the larger branches uh, of the arteries, veins, and nerves. <clears throat> so, of course, there are other fascias in the body. Uh, one prominent fascia is the uh, subserous fascia. So the subserous fascia surrounds the visceral organs in the abdomen uh, and we won't encounter that in dissection until the second half when we get into the, the visceral dissection. But it's important to know that it exists. Now I've already mentioned types of joints before but just to give you a little bit more detail about what you're going to encounter when you dissect certain joints I want to provide you with some information on these different types of joints. Uh, 
So mostly what we think about when we think about joints is the diarthrotic joints, the synovial joints uh, that are mainly present in our limbs. So these diarthrotic joints contain synovial fluid within them, and their main purpose is to facilitate movement, uh, such as in the shoulder or the uh, elbow joints, as well as the joints in the legs, of course. <clears throat> There are also cartilaginous joints, which are more solid. These cartilaginous joints uh, allow for less movement, so they're more structural, but also you know, some movement is allowed in cartilaginous joints. We'll see these types of joints in the vertebral column, particularly between the vertebrae. Uh, finally, there are fibrous joints or synarthrotic joints, and these are structural joints that form uh, during the developmental process. So here I'm showing you uh, suture joints in the skull. These are synarthrotic joints as fibrous tissue connects over the uh, bones as they grow close to each other to uh, form a concrete junction between those different bones. With the synovial joints, which is a type we'll encounter most, um, the uh, main structure that surrounds and encompasses these joints in, is called the joint capsule. This is fibrous connective tissue that surrounds and encompasses the entire joint. Uh, coordinating and providing stability to that joint capsule will also find ligaments called collateral ligaments. These collateral ligaments have specific names depending on the joint uh, in which they are located. Uh, so collateral ligament names will change, but that's just a general term for now. As we dissect into the joint capsule, we'll see the synovial fluid, which is formed by the synovial membranes. The synovial membranes are located within the joint capsule and adjacent to the articular surfaces, which are formed from cartilage. So within these synovial joints, we'll also find other kinds of ligaments. Uh, these are called generally intra-articular ligaments. Uh, so again, within each specific joint, these intra-articular ligaments will have specific names, but just in general terms, they're called intra-articular ligaments. There's also an intra-articular disc that cushions the movement of the two bones against each other. So you can see that intra-articular disc, sometimes called menisci, uh, here in this image of the knee joint. Cartilaginous joints are uh, important because they help stabilize our body and restrict movement in certain directions. So uh, particularly in the vertebral column that we were just talking about in the last lecture, there are numerous different uh, cartilaginous uh, connective tissue um, contributions to the joints of the vertebral column. So here we see some of these being highlighted. Uh, so uh, remember that the vertebral disc forms the axis of the joint movements. So the axis of our uh, back movements is centered on the uh, intervertebral disc and the vertebral bodies. So anterior to that, we will have the anterior longitudinal ligament. The anterior longitudinal ligament is going to provide stability on the anterior side, which means it's going to check or restrict extension of the back. So as we extend our back, the anterior ligament is going to stretch and become taut and limit the amount of extension we can produce on our vertebral column. Each uh, vertebral joint produces about 15 degrees of movement, 10 to 15 degrees, depending on each different intervertebral uh, section. As we move farther back, posterior to the vertebral column, we see we have a posterior longitudinal ligament. The posterior longitudinal ligament is posterior to the axis of vertebral flexion. So in that way, it checks and limits flexion of the back. Uh, this is also true of the ligamentum flava, the yellow ligament within the vertebral canal, connecting between the laminas of the vertebral arches. Finally, we also have 
the supraspinous ligament. Supraspinous meaning it's above the spinous process. So the supraspinous ligament is also important for checking flexion of the back because it is posterior to the axis of that back flexion. So it's important to understand that the location of these different ligaments is going to uh, be affected by different forces and check different movements. Uh, there are also uh, uh, ligaments on the lateral sides that connect between the transverse processes. Here we see the intertransverse ligaments connecting between the transverse processes. And of course, these are gonna check the lateral flexion of the vertebral column. <clears throat> the vertebral disc itself is composed of connective tissue as well, and it has uh, interesting structures. So the outer portion of the vertebral disc is composed of annulus uh, or annular fibers that form a circle around the nucleus pulposus, the pulpy nucleus in the middle of the vertebral discs. So I've been using, uh, starting to use anatomical terms to differentiate the directions uh, in the body. And I'm assuming that you understand these terms, but just as a refresher from perhaps undergraduate anatomy. Uh, so here this slide is representing those different anatomical positions, the different sections we can have through the body, and um, the different uh, orientations and the relative positions of structures. So if you're not familiar with these terms, be sure to um, you know, review these. Uh, feel free to ask me questions uh, to clarify perhaps what uh, deep and superficial means in relation to different structures. Uh, so um, at any rate, this slide will give you that, that information. So now let's talk about the back muscular itch itself. Generally, we differentiate back muscles based on the depth of the muscle in the back. So we have superficial back muscles and we have deep back muscles. And the different categories, the superficial back muscles, actually have a different embryological origin than the deep back muscles. The superficial back muscles are actually developed as part of the limbs. So they develop on the ventral side of the body, the side of the body that's below the vertebral axis. And for that reason, we call these muscles hypaxial muscles, hypaxial for below the axis. This is also important because these superficial back muscles are innervated by the ventral primary rami of spinal nerves. Because they or, uh, originated on the ventral side of the body and uh, traveled backward to attach to uh, portions of the shoulder blades and the back. So uh, here I'll go through some of these slides. We'll be highlighting different structures, trapezius, latissimus dorsi, all of these superficial back muscles innervated by ventral primary rami. So here we see as we, as we reflect laterally, as we reflect laterally the trapezius, meaning detach it from its central process or central attachment and move the muscle laterally, we can see that the transverse cervical artery and the accessory nerve are supplying the transverse uh, or, or trapezius, the, supplying the trapezius muscle. Uh, and so these are, the accessory nerve is actually part of the ventral primary rami, which we uh, differentiated in the last lecture. So uh, now moving on, we have removed the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi, so we can see some of these uh, intermediate muscles of the superficial back. We can see levator scapulae. Levator scapulae, as you would guess based on the name, elevate the scapulus, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the scapular bone. Uh, then moving on, we have rhomboid minor, which is more superior and smaller, uh, with rhomboid major below it. Then as we move deeper 
reflecting, uh, removing those muscles we just saw, we see that we'll find the serratus posterior superior as well as the serratus posterior inferior. So that makes up all of the superficial back muscles which are innervated by the ventral primary ramus, uh, which defines them as hypaxial back muscles from the hypaxial embryo. <clears throat> now, uh, so these next few slides, these are all taken from Gilroy's Anatomy Atlas, showing you the vectors uh, for how these muscles can cause movement and, and their attachments. So we see here, as an example, the trapezius has three different parts, a superior, middle, and inferior part, which will cause different movements. And of course, the full breadth of that muscle is being innervated by different portions of that nerve. So we can control just lower trapezius, middle trapezius, or upper trapezius individually uh, through our conscious uh, movements. Uh, so it's important to understand the location of these attachments to be able to name them and then to be able to differentiate what kind of muscle movements occur based on them. <clears throat> so uh, in my future lectures, you know, you, I'm assuming you have this textbook and I'm assuming you can get this information, so I'm not going to belabor these points, but the information is, is provided for you so that you can get the idea about where these attachments are occurring. But that's important information that you can study on your own that you don't need me to repeat. <clears throat> so as we move deeper, now we'll look at the true back muscles, also called the epaxial back muscles, meaning the muscles that formed above the axis, epaxially, above the axis in the embryo. So these muscles are all true back muscles that innervate uh, and attach to the vertebral column or the skull. So we'll uh, highlight some of these uh, in this slide deck. Again, you can study these on your own. These are color-coded in my PowerPoint slides. You have the anatomy atlas, which is critical uh, for this course. And you can see uh, how we're highlighting these different regions. Uh, and uh, I'll go ahead and um, move through this. This is going to be much more important when we get into the actual dissections though, so you'll want to revisit this. So uh, the splenius uh, or semispinalis uh, capitis muscle is beneath the splenius muscles. It travels farther down into the neck, uh, so when we dissect those we'll be reflecting the uh, splenius muscles to see that muscle. And then these are uh, the deepest back muscles, the intervertebral, uh, interspinal uh, muscles. Uh, so we'll have a, a zoomed in view of the lower thoracic and lumbar region so we can see some of these interspinalis and intertransversalis or intertransversus muscles. There are also muscles uh, rotatoris and multifidus. Uh, that will be highlighted in there as well. You can uh, take a look at those in your anatomy atlas. So when talking about the back, we've gone uh, into the neck. We've talked about the splenius muscles and the semispinalis capitis, but deep below semispinalis capitis is a region called the suboccipital triangle. This is an important region because a number of different structures, uh, neurovasculature structures, are located within the suboccipital triangle. So the landmarks for the suboccipital triangles, the attachment points for these muscles, is the C1 transverse process and the C2 spinous process. So the muscles that make up the suboccipital triangle attach to those different regions. So there's the C1 transverse process, the obliquus capitis inferioris muscle forms the lower portion of the triangle. Next we have the obliquus capitis superioris muscle forming the uh, superior lateral portion of the triangle. And then the rectus capitis posterior major forms the medial uh, superior portion of that triangle. There's a fourth muscle here that's not part of the triangle, but which we'll see when we, uh, when we reflect semispinalis capitis. And that muscle is the rectus capitis posterior 
minor muscle, which I'm highlighting here. So minor is not part of the suboccipital triangle, but it's a muscle next to the triangle that we need to know. So this picture down here, I'm showing you more of a 3D uh, quarter angle view of this region because this picture doesn't really give you, uh, justify the depth of this triangle. So the transverse process is gonna be located on the side of the neck, whereas the spinous process is located much farther back on the back midline of the neck. So this obliquus capitis inferior muscle is actually traveling mostly in the anterior direction. And so this three-dimensional picture here shows that red ob uh, obliquus capitis uh, inferioris muscle uh, traveling anteriorly. And so I just want to emphasize the three-dimensionality of this region. So what are we going to find when we look in this suboccipital triangle? When we actually do the dissection, this is ideally what your dissection is going to look at like. We'll see the uh, greater occipital nerve uh, traveling on top of the triangle. So it originates below obliquus capitis inferioris. And it will travel uh, superficially to the triangle uh, uh, around obliquus capitis inferioris up to the scalp of the head. And so this nerve provides uh, the, the sensory uh, information to the scalp of the head, the back of the scalp of the head. So it's part of the C2 dermatome providing that posterior scalp innervation. Uh, more importantly is the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery I already talked about in terms of the transverse process of the vertebral column. So the vertebral artery will actually travel through those transverse processes superiorly uh, and we'll be able to visualize it in the suboccipital triangle. But the importance of the vertebral artery is that it, it forms a major supply of the brain. So this is one of the major arteries that anastomos inside the cranial vault and supplies much of the brain. So this is a very important artery and we will be able to visualize that artery once we do the dissection. So here I'm uh, showing you how that vertebral artery travels superiorly through the uh, transverse foramina. Uh, superiorly at the suboccipital triangle, we will actually see the horizontal portion of the vertebral artery. Uh, so the vertebral artery traveling superiorly uh, takes a, a turn just above the C1 vertebrae to travel horizontally. Then it pierces the, uh, the membrane between C1 and the uh, occipital bone and travels through foramen magnum to get into the cranial vault. So that form, that's the uh, end of this lecture and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.